Yeah. What happened? Yeah, we're good. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Welcome back to the Low Carb MD podcast. This podcast, you know, Brian's going to be really upset that I didn't invite him to this one, but this one's actually extra special to me. Um, we're going to interview somebody who's actually been a role model for me and probably affected my life in a lot of ways that he, he even knows. Uh, we have today Kiyoshi Thomas Clifford. Okay. He's a martial arts expert, been training and training others in martial arts for 40 years. And I'm quite jealous of actually his accomplishments. You know, I come in here, I opened this practice in Japan, New York, and with the goal of serving my community, we've been here for two years and, you know, trying to serve my community for the past four or five years. And he's been doing it for 40 years. He's opened up, I want to say four schools, yes, four martial arts schools, and he's trained thousands and thousands of people in various martial arts, including karate, kung fu, jujitsu. And uh, there's one important person he's trained. That's me. He right. trained me for two years. I think I was 17 or 18 and 19. I, I gave two full years, full time martial arts, and he trained me. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. That's something that the audience may not know a lot about, but he trained me. And before we start, before we get into it, I, I want to talk about exactly what the main lesson that I can think of that he taught me and how it applies to every single patient that I deal with and how it applies to every single person right now. And that, that lesson that he taught me was perseverance. So first of all, I just want to say thank you, Thomas Clifford, for coming uh, on the podcast. It's an honor to be able to uh, interview you today. And I can't wait for people to hear the message uh, and the, the kind of your own struggles with health and your own struggles with uh, uh, kind of af affecting a community. I can't wait for people to hear it. Thank you. Thank you, Tro. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's an honor. It's a privilege. And uh, I hope that we can provide our communities with some, some value today. That's our intent. Yeah. So, so, you know, it's funny, we were talking a little bit before uh, earlier this week, and I was telling you that the calls we're getting in right now into this office regarding coronavirus are, Hey doc, I'm binge eating. Hey, Doc, I'm drinking alcohol again. Doc, I'm so anxious. Can you write me Xanax? Doc, I'm, I'm so stressed out. Okay? The people that are calling me right now, they're beyond stressed. They're beyond stressed. And on top of that, um, their, main, uh, you know, it's their main source of stress release, the gym, their dojo, you know, yes. their exercise has been taken away from them. Yes. It's been taken away from them. So, and lo and behold, I'm thinking to myself, okay, let me get some content out. Let me get some people out there to, to kind of, uh, 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 you know, show them how to exercise at home. And then I see a you, video of you on YouTube showing all your students, you know, a body weight exercise, you and your, you know, Under Armour outfit in your dojo doing some body weight squats. So, so let's talk about that. What do you, you know, what do you think, you know, what's your thoughts? I mean, I, how can we not talk about coronavirus right now? What are your thoughts about all this and how are you helping people? That's a great question. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's not overused. It's relevant is that, that we're, we're all in this together. We are all in this together. And, uh, that's a lot more than just a slogan or a catchphrase or something I'm going to put on a bumper sticker. It's reality. We are all in this together. And I really believe we're going to get out of this together. That's how we're going to get out of it is uh, none of us is as smart as all of us. And uh, thank God for this kind of a platform. Thank God we're able to stay connected. And you're providing a, an invaluable service to your community. You were doing it before this happened, but but it's it's more relevant and more important than ever. People can still tune into a podcast and, and get some value and some gems. So the first thing I think people need to focus on is, uh, is structure. I think structure is crucial. I, I, I think that when we go to bed at night and when we wake up in the morning and when we plan our meals 
not just what we're going to eat, but when we're going to eat, uh, when we're going to study, what we're going to, you know, let's take our children, for example, and let's look at their academics and their athletics. Those things don't go away just because they're home. It's crucial that we provide them with, with that training while we're locked down. So it's got to be scheduled. It's got to be structured. I think it's a mistake to kind of fly um, by the seat of our pants and do things off the cuff. We had a week of that. You know, at, the, at, at my house, we sort of did take a spring break. But um, tomorrow's Monday, and we're going to hit the ground running with some serious structure. So I, I think that's one of the key components is, is organizing our lives <clears throat> around the reality of the day. Um, good things usually don't happen by accident. Other than children, I can't think of too many things that occur by accident. So, so that's, that's kind of my principle. You, know, you, you brought up something really, really important and it actually segues into something that, that I wanted to talk about. You, you said, you know, enough is enough. Let's get started. Yes. Okay. And one of the things you taught me, and I'm so happy that I'm going to be able to impart what you've taught on me on so many is perseverance. Yes. And one of the things I've seen my patients struggle with, particularly when it comes to diet, you know, what happens on Friday when you're watching the news and it's all coronavirus and you're freaking out and you're anxious and you're asking your doctor for Xanax and you're, you know, you just drank some alcohol. What's going to happen next? You're going to eat well, some pizza. You're going to eat some, you know, you're going to have some ice cream. Then what yeah. happens Saturday? Saturday, you're gonna you're gonna have Chinese food and you're gonna have pizza and you're gonna have ice cream. What happens Sunday? You're gonna say, oh, you know what? I'll get it fixed on Monday. You know what? And then Monday's gonna come, and you didn't have that structure ready. You didn't have that perseverance. And then the whole week's gonna go by of pizza and, and ice cream. And then what's gonna happen is, look, that food makes you more hungry. It makes it more harder to resist the longer you go. And then then Monday comes, and then it's you know what? I'll start the first of the month. And that perseverance is lacking. And I tell yeah. my patients all the time, you know, uh, you, you, I know you drove, you drove here today, right? Yes, yeah, sir. If you, if you get into a, uh, if you, you get a flat tire, what do you do? You got to fix the flat. You got to fix it. Yeah, you yeah. call AAA, right? And what I've told my patients is call AAA. Don't, you know, put a poster board over that tire and pretend it's like a functioning tire. And don't, you know, get out of the car and say, you know what? I got a flat tire. Let me just smash all the windows and eat ice cream and eat, you know, nobody would get out of their car if they got a flat tire and smash the windows and wait until Monday and then wait until next week. If right, you that, lost, if you lost would, money, if you, you were losing money, nobody would take their wallet out and burn the rest of it and say, you know what? I'm going to start making money when I see my accountant in three weeks, pick up the phone, call Thomas Clifford, say, you know what? I've been doing karate for a year and I'm getting depressed. And I need something. And he'll say, you know what? That's great. We got a Zoom meeting for you. Pick up your phone, call your doctor, say, you know what? I don't know how to handle this stress. You would call AAA. If you yes, lost sir. money, you'd go to your bank, say, hey, what's going on? My, my bank account is in trouble. Something's wrong. So why do, why do you think that people with obesity, people struggling with lifestyle, why do you think they don't reach out for help? Uh, I think there's a lot of shame. There's a lot of embarrassment. There's, um, there's also... Or, or an underlying concern of rejection. It's hard enough to reach out, but when you reach out and somebody bites your hand, it's very difficult to reach out again. So that's why it's imperative that if people do reach out to you under any circumstances, you want to subordinate your mood to the higher purpose of, of what it is that they need at the time. We kind of have a responsibility to each other. So even if I'm not in the mood because of, circumstances that revolve around me uh i need to rise to the occasion i need to be there as a resource i'm not the source but i am a resource and when people reach out i take that seriously and i think we all should i think we all do but now more than ever it's a practice that we need to get better at we need to improve each and every time when people reach out and they're hurting and they're in pain vitally important that we try to to uh both nurture and literally nourish no pun intended what it is that they they're they're hurting from 
they, what they need, what they need to correct the problem. So back to the car metaphor, which I really like, is most people with a flat tire, they don't smash out the windows. They don't go that far. Some do. But what, what a lot do is they keep driving. And it goes from a flat tire to a broken axle. And now you got a bigger problem. And it goes from a broken axle to a problem with the, the whole motor. And then you're, and now you're into, you have no more car. You've destroyed the goose that lays the golden eggs. So it's vitally important that we, if we make a mistake, we course correct as quickly as possible. Momentum, when it's going in the wrong direction, is catastrophic. What we want to do is get the momentum moving in the right direction. It's very, very difficult when it's going the wrong way to, to change course, but it certainly can be done. People are doing it every single day. You know, what you taught me was perseverance. And what I'd like to highlight here, and I highlight it with every single patient is, look, you got the flat tire. Okay, so stop before you smash the windows. Fine, you lost some money. Stop before you burn your wallet. Stop before the axle's broken and the whole, you know, the whole thing break. Just stop. Pay attention. You know, what yeah. happened? What do you need to, what tools do you need to cultivate? Ask for help. So you know? when we talk about perseverance, like this, this is, it's, a, it's a wide topic. And what we need to do, though, is we need to start with purpose. Uh, let's, let's for a moment, uh, let's use three Ps. Let's use purpose, perseverance, and patience. The order is not trivial. In, in, in the dictionary, I think they appear in the reverse order. But uh, purpose is number one. We have to figure out the why behind diet and exercise. We have to have a higher purpose. Uh, I'm not suggesting it needs to be religious or spiritual, though that wouldn't hurt. But I have three children. And they're counting on me, and I don't do any, them any good if I'm sick, injured, if uh, I'm neglecting myself. A, it's hard for me to expect them to do the things that I'm unwilling to do. I need to lead by example in my patterns of behavior. B, I need to be at my best. I have a responsibility to be at my best. So that's one of the driving forces in my life. One of the, the things that I attach purpose and meaning to is being exemplary for my children. I, I have to do that. Not just my kids. I have, I have a, there's sort of a, a concentric widening circles of our social structure. And I really feel right now that the global community is quite connected because we're not just going through this in Rockland County. We're not going through this in, on the East Coast, not just the United States, the whole world. And uh, you, like me, we have, we have friends and family all over the globe. So I, I want to be there for everyone. I don't want to be a victim in this. I want to be a victor. I want to be an example of, uh, of effectiveness. So that would be the purpose end of it. And then with the perseverance part, it's interesting, Tro, is – uh, to cultivate a non-quitting spirit, paradoxically, you, you have to get to the point where you want to quit. See, if you don't want to quit, you're not cultivating a non-quitting spirit. You're just having a jolly good time. In other words, I've, I've gone through entire pizzas. I've, I've eaten two entire pizzas by myself. I've heard you talk about uh, your drug of choice once upon a time, I believe, was cereal. And uh, I could put down it like Captain Crunch with Crunch Berries, peanut butter cereal, like you name it. I could go through them all. That didn't require a non-quitting spirit. I don't get a medal for that. That I was having a jolly good time. Now, when I set a goal to run three miles and I get to two and a half miles and I want to quit, but I don't, that's when my non-quitting spirit is built. That's how we develop it. We get to the point where we want to quit. And then we don't quit. And that's, that's widely misunderstood because it's not a very popular approach, but it's effective. Uh, fasting is a great example. You know, I, I can't do it. I just can't. Can you do two hours? Can you go two hours without eating? Great. Now, can you go two and a half? Can you go three? Before you know it, you're doing 12 hours, 16 hours, 20 hours. You're doing full day fast. You could do a three day fast, but you have to persevere. You have to get to the point where you want to quit and then not quit. 
absolutely crucial. After that comes patience. If you're not willing to be patient and forgive yourself, if you do slip up, you're going you're gonna to end up with four flat tires. You're going to end up destroying the entire vehicle in one fell swoop. So you got to have purpose. You got to have perseverance. And when you have that perseverance, not only do you get to be patient, you've got to be patient because you can't pull up the flowers to see how the roots are doing. It's you sabotage yourself. A lot of times we know this with diet, everybody wants their results in a day. They didn't get to 250, 300, 350, 400 pounds, 600 pounds. They didn't do that in one day. But a lot of times they want to go from 600 pounds to 180 pounds in a month or two. And I don't think it works that way. In fact, we both know that it does not. You have to exercise a degree of patience. However, if you put patience before purpose and perseverance, that's not patience. That's procrastination. And my dad used to say, Thomas, procrastination is a filthy habit. It might make you go blind. And obviously that was a joke. But uh, I understood his point that procrastination is disgusting. It's a vile and repulsive behavior. So we want to replace our procrastination with our perseverance. So I think the sequencing is, is very, very vital. Figure no. out why. Do it. And when you do it, there's downtime. You got to evaluate. You got to figure out what worked, what didn't work. And then you got to get right back at it. The sun will come up tomorrow. We get another chance. And if we don't, game over. But this, when the sun comes up tomorrow, that means we have another chance. You know what? I'm, I, it's amazing what you're saying. And I don't think people, I hope people can appreciate the wisdom they're getting right now. And, and I'd like to make it super simple. The, the highest amount of weight loss I've seen in my practice is 200 pounds. We had a patient lose 200 pounds. Okay. And, and I show this graph. We have his graph. You know, it's anonymized. We, we don't put who, who this person is. But he lost 200 pounds. And I go and I show every patient who's struggling and getting impatient right? And I show them how many times he gained five pounds. Mm. He mm. gained five pounds over 20 times. Yes. And what did he do each one of those times? Each one of those times was an opportunity to figure out why he wanted to quit, what went wrong, and how to fix it. And what yes. you taught me and what I'd like to impart on everybody is we fail, we literally fail to learn how to get back up. And when it comes to lifestyle, what you're saying is so important. If you made a mistake, you, you got a flat tire, analyze. Okay, you know what? Next time, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pass by that, you know, I'm not gonna speed through that pothole. Yes. I'm gonna take a different route, right? Yes. So you have to, when you make a mistake, it's not a, an excuse to make mistakes for the rest of the week and the rest of the month. Yes. Stop, figure out what went wrong. What defenses did you blow through? What defenses yes. do you need to cultivate to be able yes. to succeed? Yeah, see, if I, if I keep driving through the same pothole, it's no longer a mistake. It's an on purpose. I, I've got to investigate my, my thoughts. I've got to really figure out why am I masochistically repeating that behavior? You know, what's the secondary gain? Like maybe, maybe you know, the lady from AAA who shows up to fix my flat is extraordinarily attractive. I don't, I don't know what it is, but I've got to figure out why it is that I've decided to continue to go that way and continue to drive through that pothole expecting a different result. So my, my mistakes, my pitfalls, uh, when I backslide, those are life lessons. Those are, that's not to be corny. That's true. If you're, you have an opportunity to learn from those things. And here's what I love about what you're doing and you have, you're bringing your your network together and you're really creating a, a dojo through your practice and through your podcast where certainly there's HIPAA rules and there's guidelines and things where there's some anonymity. But again, none of us is as smart as all of us and none of us are going to live long enough to make all the mistakes. So I want to learn from your mistakes. You want to learn from my mistakes. Because I, you could tell with Tom, there's a pothole right over there. You drive through it, you're going to get a flat. And man, is that priceless. 
That is not useless. That is priceless. It is not worthless. It's invaluable for you to share with me some of the, some of the mistakes you've made in your journey and along your path. I'm obligated to do the same thing for you. So we learn more from each other than any one individual can teach us. And that's a crucial distinction. Um, we're not going through this alone. Again, the, the, the mantra of the day is we are all in this together. But we were all in this together three weeks ago. We were all in this together last year. We've, I, we, I've been part of we are all in this together uh, 51 years ago. You could add nine months to that, depending, you know, depending on what your, what your belief system is. But my turn started at conception. That's what I believe. In other words, it's always my turn. This idea that we're taking turns is ludicrous. So sometimes it's my turn to listen to someone else's experience. Sometimes it's my turn to share with them my experience. But either way, it's always both of our turn. If, if my team is in the dugout and your team's on the field, whose turn is it? It's everyone's turn. Whose turn is it in the, with the spectators in the stadium? It's their turn. Our turn is constant, never ending. So what I like to say is it's always our turn to learn. Always. So we, we have to help each other out when it comes to the, where the quicksand is, where the potholes are, where are the venomous snakes. We have an obligation toward one another to help each other out with those things. You know, don't step on the landmine. This is where they are. So I think that's a big part of when we talk about purpose, not only the why behind what we're going to do, but we have to create a map as well. We have to, we have to create um, that structure that we talked about earlier. When we're going to go to bed at night, what time we wake up in the morning, and what are the first things we do. And contrary to, to uh, popular thought, it's not eat breakfast. It's rarely eat breakfast. Right, that we're self-sabotaging right out of the gate if the first thing we do in the morning is eat breakfast. And that's, again, that's your wheelhouse. Um, maybe you want to speak to that a little bit. Why fasting for health reasons, health reasons, let alone spiritual reasons? Why is fasting such a profoundly effective pattern of, uh, of nutrition? Well, you, you know what? I, um, it's, it's funny. People want to hear you, but I'm going to take a minute here. Um, fasting, first of all, is the most tried and tested mean, you know, you know, a practice that's been tried and tested for over 5,000 years. And the problem is, as you were talking about, and you were kind of mentioning this, is there's snakes and there's, you know, scorpions that we got to all, you know, uh, map out where they are so we can avoid them. And yes. unfortunately, our physicians and our dietitians have said things like fasting or an eating disorder, right? Fasting is an eating disorder. And they've said that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And so the problem that many people have faced, and I don't, like, I, I don't believe in being a victim, but I tr having been 350 pounds, let me tell you, this system is like the matrix. It is designed against you. Yes. Okay. It is designed for you to fail. You are being sold breakfast, you know, a breakfast of Captain Crunch, you know, a snack of, of kind bars, you know, a lunch all, that's all that, hard, well balanced breakfast. That's yeah, it's all <laughs> exactly. And the dietitians are saying it and the food companies that you're buying these whole hearty breakfasts from know exactly what ingredients to put in the soybean oil the sugar the processed carbs right they know exactly what to put in to make you a recurring customer so the problem you know you're talking about having a purpose you know cultivating perseverance right and you're talking about patience right the problem is is the purpose has been distorted by our society right and it's making that perseverance impossible you eat these crap foods for breakfast you're going to eat crap food for lunch you know so i i look i sympathize with the plight of somebody suffering from obesity food addiction binge eating because this whole system you know is is against them yes yes we're 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 kind of being set up and i don't I, it, it's you don't want to make it sound like a conspiracy 
but it's exactly what it is. And that's why I think it's very important that we identify ourselves as producers rather than consumers. And that's a vitally important distinction. I've always believed this. I was, I was raised this way. Um, I've had a lot of, uh, been very, very fortunate in, in the, the martial arts instructors who've influenced me, but it was really my father, my dad, who, who uh, conditioned me, who influenced me to believe that, listen, Thomas, you could either be a producer or a consumer. And uh, no matter what, we're, we're all consumers. There's no question about that. We consume, but it's not how we primarily identify ourselves. Um, I think it's important that we become producers. And that includes the making up of our own minds, the making up of our own minds. Um, the best things, the best things in life, no matter how much we try to do this, they, they can't be bought, they can't be taught, but they can all be learned and earned. You, they can't be bought, they can't even really be taught, but they can be learned and earned. So I, I'll give you an example. You can try to teach me how to, how to not eat and how to eat until you're blue in the face. You can try to teach me those things. But if I'm not willing to learn them, you're going to fail and I'm going to pay the price. But you will fail as a teacher. The teacher needs an eager student. So if, if the student chooses, chooses to learn, it's all there. It's all available. The resources are out there. But the easier path is to be conditioned. The easier path is to believe what it says in the back of the cereal box. The easier path is to believe the commercial on television. The easier path is to enjoy the taste of sweet in our mouths. Uh, we're, all, we're all addicts. I'm an addict. I'm addicted to endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. And that core four of, of my biochemistry, I have to leverage very carefully. I do it in the most constructive ways possible. So um, endorphins are available in other forms and they're, it's extremely attractive and appealing. And it's a very, very difficult addiction to deal with and to mitigate, mitigate. But I enjoy my endorphins. I enjoy my endorphins. I like a good dose of endorphins, but I have to generate them. I have to generate my serotonin. I have to generate my dopamine. I have to generate my oxytocin. So it's a, it's a more difficult path. That's the downside, perhaps. But the upside is it's a far more rewarding and liberating path. It moves me from victim, victim to the, re the realization that I was somewhat of a volunteer, to now I can achieve victory. Now I can move toward victory. But I have to change my role. I have to change my, my identity for con from consumer to producer. Producer of my consciousness. Producer of my well-being. Producers Pro of my endorphins. Yes. Right? Even producer of my... Can I, can I just harp in on this? Because I think this is just coming back you know, coming back to this coronavirus and people stressed, I'm getting calls every day. Can you write me Xanax? Doc, I need help. I'm drinking alcohol. Doc, I'm, I just ate chocolate. I, yeah. I couldn't help myself. And I tell them like, look, take a look at any stressed out animal. What do they do? Okay, what happens? The stress literally causes their adrenaline to go up and their, uh, their body to make glucose out of nothing, right? Literally, their liver will pump out glucose, their blood sugar will go up, and then it'll come back down. And in, out in nature, when that blood sugar comes down, you want to be hungry. You want to have stress. When that bear comes chasing after you, you want to run away. You want stress. And then when the stress is done, you want to seek out food. You want to seek out pleasurable things. You want to seek out, if you have a deer in front of you, you want to eat it. You have berries in front of you. You got honey in front of you. You want to eat it all. The problem is and we're, we're constantly under stress, right? We're constantly under stress. And then when that stress is done, the refrigerator is two steps away. And the food that you're going to seek out comfort with is going to make you hungry two hours later. Okay. Yes. And so, and the, so the problem is this. And I tell people, look, every one of us is suffering right now. And people are turning to alcohol to seek out comfort and stress reduction. They're turning to 
you know, uh, there's more domestic turmoil because of they're looking to get rid of energy, right? Sure. And and they're turning to food because that's the easiest and quickest comfort we have, right? Yeah. But you're right. You have to be a producer of your own. Go outside. When you're done with that ice cream, you're not going to be happy with what you did, okay? But when you go outside for a walk or when you do your online, you know, class with your, you know, martial arts instructor in your bedroom with your kids, you're damn right you're gonna be happy when you talk, when you cultivate relationships, talk to people, you're gonna be happy at the end of that. That's serotonin, you're gonna be happy and proud about what you did, but the, you know, you became a producer of happy hormones and yeah, not a we, consumer of happy hormones. And I love that, I love that, I love that message. Yes, sir, yeah, we, we look, it, it's, it's quick and easy to seek the exogenous, but the endogenous is available to us right now, you know, and it's, it's learning how to access it. And, and again, I'm not, I'm not against medication. I'm not against medication. I'm not against surgery. I'm not against, there's a lot of modalities of medicine that are miraculous. They're necessary. And, uh, they're keeping people not just, not just able to survive and be alive, but to thrive, to really optimize their lives. And I, I'm a, I'm a card carrying fan of optimizing our health but most of the solutions are able to be accessed from within if we know how to do it when the when the when the animal is stressed in nature they don't run to the cereal aisle they don't open up the refrigerator they find the solution the, the nutrition solution to the deficit that they've created they find it in nature we don't we have to be a lot more consciously aware they actually don't have the same challenges that we do for the most part because they have a, a much smaller menu of choices. We have a really very difficult um, uh, obstacle course to navigate our way through because there's a, a lot of things that are bad for us screaming for our attention. So again, they say, this goes back to what's your purpose. I got to remind, I have to remind myself is, why am I doing this? When I'm getting these hunger pains, when I'm fasting, and my, my, my body starts to give my mind signals, if I allow my mind to play tricks with me instead of me mastering my mind, I'm, I'm having a bowl of spaghetti. I'm going to, hey, listen, food's being delivered right now, and God bless the people out there who are, who are providing, who are producers. They're, they're trying to do the right things for the right reasons but many of us are making the wrong choices. So we've got to get back to the higher purpose behind, what if we're stuck at home for the next three to six months? Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm, I'm certainly not an infectious disease specialist. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a martial arts guy. I'm a karate guy. That's, this is what I do, it's who I am. But I am aware that there's a tremendous number of people in this country who are morbidly obese. There's a tremendous, they're not, they're not starving. When we talk about um, a, a problem with food in this country, we're not talking about a lack of, we're talking about an overabundance of the wrong things. People are not starving, but they're certainly malnourished. Obesity continues to climb. I'm not, I'm not an endocrinologist. I don't know much about, about diabetes. I don't know much about type one and type two, but I do know that that about a year ago, my, my fasting glucose was a little bit high. My A1C was 5.4, and the warning bells went off. I, I have responsibilities. I'm not going to mess around. I don't want to wait until my numbers are more difficult to mitigate. There, you, no matter what level they get to, there's always something that you can do to improve them, unless you're dead. You can always do something to improve them. But I want to jump on it a little bit more quickly. And that's what I recommend people do. They take the opportunity right now. What better time right now than to establish a better structure of rest, of nutrition, of exercise, of your academic pursuits, uh, your athletic pursuits. We have a golden opportunity right now to really develop some disciplines that are going to serve us when the sun comes out, it's going to come back out. We're going to, this is not the end of the world. It's going to turn, but are we going to have momentum going toward type two diabetes, heart disease, and a stroke, 
or are we gaining momentum toward a lifestyle that's actually better than the one that we started with when this crisis began? That's my challenge to everyone. It's my challenge to myself. It's my challenge to my family. And it's a challenge to the people in my circle of influence. It's ever expanding. We can come out of this happier, healthier, more fit, legit, with spirit that won't quit. That's, that's, that's my thought on the subject. You know, un unfortunately, I, I, look, I, everything you're saying is absolutely right. Everything you're saying is absolutely right. But if I know anything about history, particularly medical history, knowing what happens kind of after the depression, yeah. I, unfortunately, I think we're going to see we're several, several no. terrible things happening. I think we're going to see an increase in suicide. I think we're going to see an increase in alcoholism. I think we're going to see an increase in binge eating. And I, I got to be honest with you, my practice is desperate to reach to people, right? We are desperately trying to reach people regularly. Reach out to us if you need help. Call us if you need help. I can only help maybe 500 people. You know, we're trying to put out content. Guys, like this is the time, exactly what you're saying. Focus on yourselves, develop that structure. Take that one hour a day. You got it, you're home. Right, go walk with your kids. Do a virtual dojo. You know, have a virtual dojo. We're bringing it to you. It's right, a golden opportunity. It's a golden opportunity, but but the right decisions have to be made. And the, the challenge is, is, these things are not extraordinarily difficult to do. Most of them, but the challenge is that the wrong things are just very easy to do. In other words, is is fasting really difficult? I, I think fasting is easy. I just think that feeding myself is easier. It's not that fasting is not easy. It's pretty easy, but it's a lot easier to open up the fridge. That when we compare the difficult with the easy, it's relative. It's a completely relative thing. So there's going to be a high propensity to take what is called the low road. And I'm not, I'm not making anyone wrong uh, or trying to shame them for making bad decisions. But I, I'll use a little bit of leverage and say this is that uh, I need to not focus on what provides me with an escape. What this whole opportunity is, is a confrontation. People, people pervert the purpose of a dojo, of a place where they go to do martial arts. And it's a very common and uh, popular belief that when you go to the dojo, you're going there to escape the misery of your existence. You leave all your problems at the door and you do something you really enjoy. And the problem with that is those things that you left at the door are there when you walk back out, they're waiting for you. And while you've grown a little bit stronger, those things have grown stronger at the same time through benign neglect. So the, the real paradigm is you don't go to the dojo to escape. You don't go to the yoga studio to escape. You don't go to the gym to escape. Because in my mind, all of those things are dojo. You go there to have a confrontation, a confrontation with yourself. You go there to, to first diagnose and then treat. You have to evaluate and then elevate. The idea that you're gonna go there to be in denial is a perversion of its fundamental purpose. So we have an opportunity right now to take a long look in the mirror to really do an inventory and a checkup and figure out where we're at in our lives and what we need to repair and what we need to fix. And it's exciting. It's an adventure. It really is. I mean, we know darn well that when, when the, the, the patient who you mentioned who gained five pounds many, many times along the path to losing 200, uh, while those experiences were, were perhaps jolts, um, how delightful do you think it was? I mean, you know how delightful it was as he saw the weight moving in the right direction, as he saw the reduction take place, as he saw the consequences and the results of nourishing his body rather than poisoning it. Poisoning it. So it's very exciting. I think we, we don't put enough attention on how good it feels to move in a beneficial direction. We know how good it feels to self-sabotage. We know how good it feels to poison our bodies. Um, I know I'm a, I'm, 
we, we all know people who've struggled with all sorts of substance abuse, including, uh, including sugar. Uh, but let, let's take uh, alcohol, for example. Most people who I am close with who struggle with alcohol share with me that they haven't had a good time drinking alcohol in God knows how many years. They're not doing it for a good time. They're doing it because they're self-medicating, getting out of pain. So what's the, what's the intelligent course of action? They have to find a way to replace that substance with a better behavior, with a behavior that's good for them, that serves them. I think doing nothing is one of the most difficult aspects of, of personal development, is the downtime, is the idle time. That's why when you say to somebody, you got to fast for 18 hours, you know, one of the first things they say to me is, and they ask me is, what the hell do I do in those 18 hours? <laughs> And, and, and that's what I want to say to them. Tell me all the things in the last three weeks that you could have, would have, should have done, but you didn't. And everyone has a long list of what they could have, would have, should have done, and they didn't. Well, that's what you do in those 18 hours. We all have plenty to do. I don't know anybody who's really bored, but people certainly tend to allow themselves to be boring. And then they confuse their, bore, their boring knit with boredom. Tell you a real quick story. You know, I'm sitting around in summer. I'm about nine years old. I'm over at my friend David Brady's house and we're all laying around. There's like nine of us in his living room because he's got air conditioning. It's the middle of the summer and we're laying around like a bunch of lazy cat across the couch, on the floor, got one leg over and all this. Just an absolute pathetic scene. And his dad comes out and says, why are you guys so boring? Why are you guys so boring? And I thought he was miscommunicating. I thought he meant, why are you guys so bored? But he meant what he said, and he was dead on accurate. We weren't bored. We were boring. We're eight, nine years old. We got the world by the tail. We got a, a creek right across the street with frogs in it. We got trees to climb. We got baseball bats and gloves. and We got all sorts of stuff to do. But we allowed ourselves to pretend to be bored while in fact, we were born. So that fasting period, you got to occupy time and space with something. Well, exercise is a good one. Your academic pursuits are a good one. Your relationship building is a good one. Um, there is time for rest. There is time for taking a nap. Uh, there's time to fix the things that need to be repaired physically and mentally. There's a lot of things we could do in those 18 hours. Now, one of them I think should be we need to serve our community in any way that we possibly can. Right now, we can't go out there and do it physically. But you said earlier, we got to make our, we have to make sure that our messages are not only outbound. When that, when that phone rings, we got to pick it up. It can't all be text message. It can't all be podcast. It's got to be interactive. We have to provide our community with opportunities to actually um, exchange thoughts and ideas, hear each other's voices, uh, be a system of support. One of the best ways that, that I can help you is to help me. And one of the best ways that you can help me is to help you. I love the old saying of, um, I'll take care of me for you, and then you take care of you for me. I think that's a good first step. A good second step is, while I'm helping you, I always feel at the end of my helping you that I really helped myself. I don't feel guilty about it, but I always feel when, when I'm a benefit to others, I was very much helpful to myself. It was an, a rewarding experience. The idea of, remember when our parents would say things like, uh, it's better to give than to receive. And I'd kind of roll my eyes and say, well, you know, you got to be kidding but it, it, it often is better to give than to receive. If you have information that somebody else desperately wants and needs, I think you're, you're morally obligated to provide them with that. And not to get too deep into a tangent, but let's talk about the redistribution of wealth. Let's talk about economics, because I'm not an economist, but let's talk about the, the distribution of wealth. I believe there's only one kind that's genuine, authentic, and sincere, and that's education. See, 
Joe, when you teach me the benefits of fasting and the benefits of what foods to avoid and what foods to embrace, and you really educate me into the principles of sound nutrition, you lose nothing. You lose nothing. By giving me that information, you've still got it. The difference is now I have it too. And I can redistribute that wealth. I'm not a professional. I certainly refer people to you because this is your wheelhouse. But getting them there, part of getting them to reach out to you for some professional intervention is me being able to share with them the information that you so generously gave to me. That's the redistribution of wealth. If I have some exercises, if I have some, so a series of developmental exercises that build strength and flexibility and endurance, it's incumbent upon me to share those things with other people. I don't lose them by doing it. I don't lose those exercises. In other words, when I give you a dollar and you give me a dollar, we each only still have a dollar. But when you give me an idea and I give you an idea, now we each have two ideas. Neither of us lost anything, but we both gained something. That's part of what's going to get us through this. Part of what's going to get us through this is being a role model for the people who aren't as far along the path as we are. As far along the path as we are, there's other people who are much further. I mean, you have a, I've listened to, in, in the last three weeks, I think I've listened to 77 of your close to 100 podcasts. I think I've listened to 77 already. In a very short period of time, I'm absolutely enamored by them because of their value. It's obvious to me in listening to those things that many of the people who you're bringing on, you're learning from them. They are, they are, they are providing you with information that's helping your practice to grow. And you know what they lose by doing that? Nothing. They lose nothing. There's no conflict of interest. There's, there's plenty to go around for everybody. And that's the real risk redistribution of wealth is the exchange of good ideas. Another concept I want to share with our listeners or your listeners and your audience is this, is that it's, it's very common for us to be good idea resistant and bad idea receptive. And that goes back to the, the challenges of consumerism, the challenges of identifying ourselves as a customer or a consumer, almost as if we're proud of it, rather than adopting the role of producer. And when we're consumers, it's extraordinarily convenient to be good idea res re resistant and bad idea receptive. We want to reverse those. We want to be good idea receptive and bad idea resistant. So an example would be the myth, the lie, the conspiracy, the uh, what I consider to be one of the most destructive uh, uh, assaults on the well-being of the, the people, across, people across the globe is the science behind sugar. And I, 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 don't, you, I don't want to speak to it from a medical perspective because I don't know what I'm talking about. But I do know that um, once upon a time, we were compelled to believe that low fat was a pathway to optimal health and that sugar intake was not as negatively consequential as some already knew and believed. And uh, to me, that's a prime example of, uh, we were very bad idea receptive. We were very bad idea receptive to, to kind of bite the, uh, the proverbial uh, poison and believe that somehow high sugar in our diets was not gonna lead to catastrophe somewhere down the road. And we're seeing it right now. So now here, here's the other side of that, is being uh, good idea resistant is, is you tell me, listen, Tom, get your fasting up to 18 hours a day. Get it up to, you, get, you go 24. Go 36. You could, you could go. You could do a 72-hour fast, and you can optimize your health in these ways. Well, it's very easy for me to hear that and to be good idea resistant because what you're telling me is difficult. What you're telling me is difficult, and there's almost always a relationship between 
what is difficult and what is the, the correct course of action. And there's almost always a correlation between what is too easy and what is definitely detrimental. There's almost always a correlation between those two things. So is, is being wealthy easy? Is it easy to be wealthy? No, it's not easy to be wealthy. And it's difficult to be wealthy. It's not easy, and it's easy. Is it easy to be poor? Well, it's easy to be poor, and it's not easy to be poor. In other words, each end of the spectrum co comes with their own challenges, their own difficulties. It's, it's, is it difficult to fast? Is it difficult to avoid X, Y, and Z foods? Uh, it's certainly difficult. Is it easy to live with the consequences? It certainly is. In other words, is it easy to be healthy and fit? It's easy to be healthy and fit, but it's difficult to become healthy and fit. Is it easy to be unfit and unhealthy? It's very easy to get there, but it's very difficult to live with. It's very difficult to live with the consequences of poor health and poor fitness. There's so, so much, there, 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 there's so much here that I just want to unpack. And I'm going to just kind of go, I've been taking notes here feverishly because I agree with everything you're saying. You know, first of all, what you're saying about learning, knowing what a good message is and what a bad message is. And you talked about kind of 40 years ago, 50 years ago, when we were saying low fat is a, yeah. is a good message. Now, the problem is, I'm going to tell you, and every listener right now is going to be shocked. I agree with a low fat diet. A low, terrible fat diet, you know, low trans fats, low processed seed oils, the soybean oil that every single restaurant, that every single Chinese food restaurant, pizza shop, bodega, every food company, the soybean oil that they use, that they're adding to their food that makes you more insulin resistant. I believe in a low fat diet. I just happen to believe a diet that's not low fat in olive oil avocado oil and pure olive oil, not one that's cut with canola oil. I happen to believe that a diet filled with natural fats in real foods like meat, fish, eggs is perfectly fine. So I believe in the low fat message, but what is the good messaging there? Low crap fat. People say, oh, you know what, doc, I'm going to go on a low carb diet. And then they take, uh, you know, uh, skin, you know, a, a chicken, whatever, a chicken thigh or chicken wing, and they fry it in soybean oil, and they dip it in, you know, a processed, uh, you know, a, a ranch dressing from Kraft that's made with soybean oil, right? And they look, look, doc, this is high fat. You said high fat was good. Fat is good. You should embrace fat. No, you should be on a low fat diet. That person needs to be on a low fat diet, right? Go take a steak, eat it. Go have some fish, eat it. Go get some shrimp and eat it. Go take an egg, eat it. Why are you adding any fat? Why are you adding butter? Why are you adding soybean processed oils? I got no problem with butter. Why are you adding it? It's not because of a healthy fat. So I love the fact that you're talking about the messaging, right? And then low sugar. Everybody's low sugar, low carb right now. And I have people coming to me saying, doc, should I never eat a plant again? <laughs> you know, I saw that the broccoli and the asparagus I'm eating and the, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the uh you know the should i never eat a plant again well, look if you could tolerate it why not eat it why not include it if you enjoy it it's nutritious you have no negative side effects from it go ahead eat it right go ahead and eat it why are, you know so the idea here is what is the proper messaging is so important what is the purpose right why am i doing what i'm doing don't just believe what you're told ask questions and this is you talked about this and I just want to come back to one other thing you talked about because I think it's so important. You talked about people coming into your dojo and they're coming there to escape. Yes. And that's such a problem because we have people that go to the gym. I have people coming into my practice with six packs and they come in saying, doc, I can no longer out exercise my eating habits and I don't know what's wrong and I can't stop. You should be going to the gym, to the dojo, out on the track, out on the trails with a purpose yes. to get better, to get more mobile, to free your body, to get, you know, to be able to do more and move more within your body and an expression of your ability to move. It is not a punishment for your food addiction. 
It is not a punishment. You cannot outrun, and I know you agree with this, you cannot outrun a bad diet. You can it's try, not, but in the end, not, you will fail. It's not possible. It's 100% it's not possible. So I mean, are I, you going to be on a hamster wheel because you lack purpose and you don't understand what is going on? Okay? You're, you should be exercising to, to, to release endorphins, to move, to feel good. You know, to go to a class and support a community and have them learn from you and teach others, right? So, it should not be a punishment for so your that, inability to understand why you can't stop eating. Yeah, here, here's one of the, the paradoxical challenges we're facing is we're doing it right now. And everyone right now is, is going to be in front of a screen now more than ever. It's not new. The screen that we were in front of for six, seven hours a day before the, 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 the smartphone, before the tablet, before the computer was called a television set. So this is not new to us. This is, we've been doing it for quite some time now, but it's not, it's not uh, shrinking, it's growing. The, 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 right now, our children are gonna be in front of screens more than ever. So we have to decide one, what's going to be on the screen. That's a, that's a, that's an important part. What is going to be on the screen that they're looking at? Who is going to be on the screen that they're looking at? What's the message and who's the messenger? Because for a lot of time, a lot of time we conveniently would hold the messenger harmless. And, uh, and in the martial arts, we, we, uh, we don't say a bad word, but we call uh Bushido on that. That's Bushido. That the message That's hilarious. I love it. Bullshit. <laughs> messenger should not be held harmless. The, the yeah. messenger is often a guilty party. So we want to make sure that we're, we're very careful in who is on the screen, who are we listening to, and what is their message. That's A. B is this. We've turned an enormous part of our lives into a two-dimensional audiovisual experience. And that's a problem because we're not two dimensional. You go back to this idea of depth. Depth is an acronym. And the acronym of depth stands for demonstration, explanation, programming, training, and habituation. So you can either have a superficial educational experience, a superficial life experience, or you could have one with depth. The one I prefer, the one I know you prefer, and the one I really think everybody prefers. Has and depth. deserves, and deserves. And and deserves. However, living life on the surface is often comfortable and convenient. But comfort and convenience is no longer what we're after. We just can't be after that right now. We cannot be. We cannot be. That will, that will make the consequences of a viral illness pale in comparison. That, that will turn the actual virus into a minimal health threat and create a bigger lifestyle challenge, a greater challenge than we've ever faced before if we continue to indulge in the superficial. Can I so, just say, it's already made the virus worse. If you look absolutely. at the data, so when we look at the data for coming from Italy and coming from China and Wuhan and coming from Germany, the patients, okay, about 70% of the people dying have hypertension, which is basically saying you have metabolic syndrome. Okay, about 40%, almost 40% have diabetes, right? Another four, 30 to 40% smoke or have lung disease. I mean, this is truly a disease that is going after, like any disease, that is going after comorbidities, right? The yes. average comorbidity in somebody dying from coronavirus is 3.7, meaning they have, you know, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and on average, and smoke the average person dying. So going after the, you know, the, the comfort and the, you know, what did you call it? The comfort and the, you comfort know. And, comfort and convenience, the quick and the easy. It, you know, going after, literally, I, I, it seems that it will make this virus more deadly. And so I, I'm telling people every day, you need to make yourself a strong host. Yes, wash your hands. Yes, practice safe distancing. Yes, if you have somebody sick in the home, you better put on a mask when you walk out just to be courteous to others. This is a deadly virus. But ultimately, you have to make yourself, you got to sleep, reduce your stress, take care of your anxiety, eat real food, 
so that you could be a strong host, reverse your metabolic disease. We can reverse metabolic disease in weeks. It takes three weeks with fasting and proper low carb dieting. And what better three weeks to do it than to do it now? Now, one of the, one of the obstacles in the way is people think, oh my God, you're crazy. This is the worst time to do it. This is the worst because, because of my anxiety and my stress. No, 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 no. This is the best time because of your anxiety and your stress. You will have a very, very, uh, again, I don't want to say quick and easy because that's contradicting what we believe or what we know. <clears throat> it's going to be difficult. It's, it's going to be a challenge, but it's not going to take forever. You just said it. It's a two or three week process. Um, we're, we're in for a long two or three weeks. We might as well make our next two or three weeks extraordinarily rewarding. So let, let's, I want to, I want to kind of focus on a couple of things that, that I think help people to kind of snap out of a, a, a I don't want to say a stupor, but we tend to be a little bit hypnotized. Um, there's a lot of things that I'll do to myself that I wouldn't dream of doing to my children. And I wouldn't even dream of doing to my cat. Like I've never gone to the supermarket and picked up a carton of cigarettes for my cat. I've never picked up a bottle of whiskey for my cat. I've never like had somebody run to Patterson, New Jersey and score some heroin for my cat. Now I've, n I've done none of those things for myself either, but I know people who have, I'll tell you what I have done. I've gone to the supermarket and scored some Captain Crunch. I've gone and, and scored uh, three large pizzas with everything on them. I've scored some absolutely atrocious substances that I've abused my body with that I would never dream of doing to my cat. I would, just wouldn't do it. Not because my cat's not interested in those things, because I wouldn't abuse my cat in that way but I would do it to myself. That's called insanity. I would not do most of those things to my children. That's called lacking self-advocacy. And this yeah. is something we talk about all the time, lacking self-advocacy. And I just want to take a little segue to talk about everybody that struggles with a substance, including food, focuses on the impulse control. Oh, I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't fast. I just couldn't abstain. But you know what? There's a lot more to willpower than impulse control. There's, are you aware of why you're compelled? Are you prepared for when you will be compelled? Okay. Will you self-advocate when you're in that shopping aisle, in a hysteria, looking at Captain Crunch? Do you have a support system and a community that's going to help you? Call my office. I'm about to buy that Captain Crunch. Just text me. I'll call you. I'll pick up the phone. I don't care what time it is. Do you have the support and the community? Right? Are you going to your, you know, uh, 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 you know, dojo? Well, now you can't. But are you going to your? Are you expressing your weaknesses and your difficulties and learning from how other people overcame them? Your support and community, because those will defend you when your impulse control or your sponsor will help you when you're suffering. And then let's say you do screw up and you give in to that Captain Crunch in that aisle. Okay, figure out what went wrong. The perseverance. This is something you taught me. Thomas, I mean, this is what you taught me, perseverance. What went wrong? Which one of those defenses did I blow through? Could I have called Thomas when I was in that aisle and said, you know what, Thomas, I'm, I, I'm about to get Captain Crunch. What would you have told me? Tro, get the hell away from there. Come over. Yeah. I'll make you a steak dinner. You I know? tell you, yes. Uh, you know, I, I would perseverance is huge. Like an unbelievably effective actionable item is, Tro, I want you to, I want you to drink three bottles of water. I want you to think, I just want you to drink three bottles of water. I want you to fill your gut with water right now. And a lot of those, those the biofeedback mechanisms that make you hungry are going to be satiated with water, with water. You're not going to taste sugar. You're not going to enjoy the flavors of the things that you're addicted to. But man, oh man, there's been an enormous number of times where I wanted to put the wrong things in my body. And when I replace that with water, those, those, I don't want to say that they go away entirely because I'd be lying, but what an effective replacement for stuff in my face with the foods that I shouldn't is just drinking three bottles of water. Can I, can I chime in here, Tom? So one of the mantras we have here is do not restrict, replace. Okay. Do not restrict, replace. And what you're doing is just to explain it in scientific terms, 
We have a natural biofeedback mechanism when our stomach is full and bloated. It sends a signal to our brain, you're done. Okay, you're done. You don't want too much more. You can't fit more. Okay, this is a natural feedback mechanism to tell your brain you're done. Okay, not only that, but when you are stressed, have stress induced hyperphagia, you're about to have that Captain Crunch is sitting in right in front of you, right? It won't last there forever. That stress won't cause your appetite to be there forever. After the one or two hours it takes to kind of drink that three glasses of water that, that Thomas is talking about, you that, that glycemic shifts that that stress causes, that's telling your brain you're hungry, are going to settle down. They're going to go away. Okay? So now you're leveraging time to become satiated. So not only the fullness, but also the time. All right? And ask any bodybuilders have known this for a long time. They've been practicing this for a long time. Okay? When, how does low-carb diets fit into this? Okay? That turkey you're eating or that beef you're eating, that protein and that fat, sends off signals of neurohormones, neuropeptide YY, CCK. It sends another signal to your brain. You don't need to eat that Cap'n Crunch. You got something else that's actually nourishing you, right? So we 100% believe in do not restrict, replace. What are you going to replace it with? When you're stressed out and you're hungry, are you going to replace it because you know going to the dojo or doing your online you know, kind of exercise uh, uh, is going to give you a replacement that you need to reduce your stress and it's going to buy you time and drinking those three cups of water is going to fill your stomach and if that doesn't work eating a steak okay and that that, that is a gem that is a gem don't restrict replace like you just you didn't give me an emerald a ruby a sapphire you just gave me a diamond you handed me a diamond like that actionable principle of don't restrict replace is worth its weight in gold. You just, you gave me a diamond, but you still have that diamond. Whoever's listening to this right now, the doctor just gave us all a diamond. That's a diamond. That's the redistribution of wealth. We can use that diamond. And, and we, that diamond, we can spend for the rest of our lives. And we can give that diamond away to other people. Don't restrict, replace. Everybody should repeat that out loud right now so they don't forget. Don't restrict, replace. I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to be dramatic. I'm, I'm unbelievably inspired by that kind of actionable information. You know, you and your practice, you got kind of a, a four-prong approach. And I, 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 don't, I don't know this because you told me, and I'm not even, I'm not even gonna assume it. I already know it. You provide people with information, and with inspiration. The challenge becomes their implementation and what I call integration, which means it's now part of their lifestyle. It's not, it's not just something that they've done a time or two. It's something that's part of their lifestyle. That integration that leads to integrity. So the information, you're an expert. You went to school for it. You work for it. You're, you're an unbelievable sponge of information and knowledge, you're, you're constantly learning. Whenever I speak to you, you're talking about what you're learning now and what you're learning next and who you're studying from and with. And so you provide invaluable information. You're an extraordinarily inspirational guy. You, you, you're, there's no hypocrisy here. You are, you've, you've been there, you've done that, you've got the t-shirt and the hat. You yourself, have done everything. You've done, nothing that you're asking others to do is unfamiliar to you. You've transformed your life, man. And I think that that gives you an unbelievable level of not just formal authority, but moral authority. But th those parts are, are, that's challenge one, information and inspiration. It's the implementation that I, I think you agree, I know you agree, is the challenge for the patient, for the student, for the client for our friend or our family member, is to get them to make this actionable. And then finally, to where it's integrated to the, the idea of going back is, not, is no longer attractive and appealing. It doesn't mean that they can't backslide. It doesn't mean that they won't relapse. But it's no longer got the same pull and the same appeal that it once had because it's actually part of their lifestyle. It's not a diet. 
It's not, it's not something that they're going to do to get ready for the beach or a wedding. It's their nutritional pattern. It's how they nourish themselves 365 days a year. That, that integration leading toward integrity is crucial. So that's what we're all trying to do. We're all in the same boat. We're either trying to do that individually. We're trying to be an example or a role model of that. And we're really trying to get everybody to do it collectively. And, and, and why? Because it, it, it makes the world a better place. Like Andy Robbins talks about a class one experience. And I, I really like his, his, uh, his concepts, his principles. Um, if it feels good and it's good for you, good for others and serves the greater good, it's a class one experience. I want to repeat that. Everybody should repeat it with me. Feels good. It's good for me. It's good for others. It serves the greater good. That's class one. Here's the challenge. Some things don't always feel good. Exercise doesn't always feel good, but it's good for me. It's good for others. And it serves the greater good. It doesn't always feel good though. And that's where the challenge lies. But you know what yeah. I loved? You know what I loved about coming to and training with you? You were so compassionate. You know, the people who were experts, you pushed them in the way that benefited them. The people who were bigger, who struggled, who had joint pain, you showed them how to do it at their pace, at, the, at their ability. You didn't make it hurt. It doesn't yeah. have to hurt. I have a hard time taking compliments. I really do. But I can't tell you how much I appreciate your recognition of that because it, it, it makes me emotional. Um, I pride myself, I really do, in, uh, in trying to meet people where they are. I, 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 uh, I despise a lack of empathy. I, despise, I, have, I have no empathy for people with a lack of empathy. Um, I have very little compassion for those without compassion. And really, uh, upon listening to myself say that, I actually do have empathy for people with no empathy. And, compassion for people with no compassion because a terrible way to live it's a struggle, uh, it's a struggle in of itself man you got to meet people where they are you got this idea that that you're gonna look it, it it's 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 easy it's easy to to coach the kid who was born on third base who was born on third base he's got the genetics he's got he's self-driven he's motivated easy to do that's easy to take an adult who's already fit and healthy and teach them a move or two and hang your hat on that as if it was your fault. It's not your fault. They came to you that way. But I, I really get the most fulfillment out of influencing people who struggle the most, who struggle most. See, I don't know what it's like to be 85 years old with bone on bone arthritis and all of my joints, but I, I plan on getting there. That might sound, funny to people you go why would you want to get there i i want the privilege of getting 85 i want to be 90 years old and i know when i'm 90 years old my 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 vehicle my meat wagon is not going to be in the best of condition it'll be in the best of condition that i'm capable of keeping it in and getting it into but i don't want to lack compassion and empathy for people who are already there because they can't jump as high as I can or run as fast or what once upon a time they could. And I'll tell you something about people who are in their 60s, 70s and 80s. They didn't get there accidentally. Not everybody makes it to their 60s, 70s and 80s. So they know things that I don't. And I just, I, I really find it uh, despicable when we're not able to meet people where they are that they're, they're they're no pun intended they're hungry they're starving to address their inadequacies their deficiencies and their flaws and they come to us for help and we snub them i haven't we, met one person that said you know what i am so happy to be a patient suffering from obesity i right. love it when i right. eat pizza like, Doc, I, uh, this is what I hear all day long, and you hear it too. Uh, you know, I want to come in, right? I want to come into the office. I want to come into the dojo. I want to stop. They just don't know how. They just They're hurting for certain. They're hurting for certain. So it's so, it's so crucial. People know how to, uh, 
to punish themselves. They know how to, to uh, perceive and to punish. They don't know how to recognize reward and reinforce. And if they do know how to recognize reward and reinforce, they make a mistake. They make a strategic error. We've made the same mistake. My, my 11 year old daughter does something extraordinarily well. I recognize it. And then I reward it with an ice cream cone. And I reinforce in her mind that when she does something great, she gets rewarded with food that's not going to nourish her body. It's a strategic error. It's not that the intentions were good, but the strategy was bad. I need to recognize reward and reinforce in effective ways. I have to choose a better, I got to notice, I've got to appreciate, and I've got to get her to believe. I have to nab her. And I, I want to recognize that you and Brian are extraordinarily effective in this idea of nabbing your listener. You get them to notice, appreciate, and believe the things you're sharing with them. And you really nab them. You nab their attention span, and your message is wholesome, and you're an extraordinarily effective pair of messengers you guys just do an incredible job not everybody has the ability to nab it's a skill you have to cultivate to get people to notice appreciate believe uh, there's a lot of people doing that with erroneous information they get them to notice that this food tastes good they appreciate that this food tastes good they believe that this food because it tastes good is also good for them they're nabbing people with the wrong information. Yeah. And they have yeah. teams of engineers doing this. Doritos oh. literally has teams of engineers sitting there just, you know, figuring out how to vary the spice profile in each chip so that you yeah. keep coming back for more. The advertising, they are robbing you. They are distracting you and you're attracted to that distraction. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I, know. I, I just want to say, like, we're coming on an hour and a half. We're going to have to have you come back and talk because I think we got to make this a series because I'm already so inspired uh, from everything you're saying. And we've talked offline and people don't know this, but we've talked about how we can work together, whether it's a clinical study like Ben Bickman to, to just show that we can affect the community. And uh, you know, I, I'm going to have to have you back and I'm sure when Brian hears this, he's going to be like, man, I got it. We got to get this guy on again and again. And, um, just thank you for coming. Thank you for coming thank and sharing you. your thank wisdom. And how do people, let's say, okay, somebody's like, I, I love this. I love this message. How do they find you? How do they get a hold of you? How do they start with you? And I know you're kind of playing with this uh, 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 remote kind of uh, classes, you know. Uh, sure. how, do, how do they get started? How do they find you? How, you know, how do they get a hold of you? How do they learn from you? Okay, so I'm going to give my phone number. And, and I'm giving my phone number out and I'm going to, I'm going to say before I give it out, I'm going to do it. Um, because right now we're in such a crisis that I'm going to try to do my very, very best. This is my promise. I'll do my best to, uh, to answer the call. That's 845-826-5149. Um, and doc, that's up to you to whether you think that's a good idea or not. <laughs> email, email. Uh, Clifford, C-L-I-F-F-O-R-D, M-M-A, at gmail.com. Uh, Facebook, uh, Thomas Clifford is my personal profile. Uh, Tro and I share the same hairstyle. So uh, you'll see a picture. I, I don't have the, the, the uh, four o'clock shadow, but you'll find me on my personal profile at Thomas Clifford. And we have a group page called a dojo for everyone a dojo for everyone it was a closed group but we've opened it up and uh everybody has access so those are the best ways um if i tell you like we're gonna keep doing this uh, the next however many weeks I, I i really feel um a moral obligation to try to do whatever part i can in in keeping people's minds and bodies moving in a in a beneficial direction so let's give them a quick cliffhanger of, of next time when we talk about depth which is demonstration explanation programming training habituation everyone out there that everything that you've learned in your life you've learned in that way
The demonstration is visual. The explanation is auditory. The programming is kinesthetic. That's bringing the, the information from your central nervous system to your peripheral nervous system. It's how we cultivate skill, through programming, through repetition. Training is merely programming at a higher degree of intensity. Habituation is the result. What happens when you get there? You rinse and you repeat because you can always do things better the next time. So it's demonstration, explanation, programming, training, habituation. Uh, it's what the doctor built this practice on. It's what whatever your competencies are out there, you've used that method to acquire those competencies. So let's talk about that next time because that's actionable and beneficial to absolutely everyone. I, I, absolutely, I absolutely love it and you know that. And uh, guys, I'm, I'm really, this podcast actually means a lot to me. Uh, you've got to meet somebody who's personally affected my life, uh, who's given me wisdom that I've carried with me um, and that I've been able to use to succeed. And, um, you know, it's, it's an honor and, and uh, such, a, such a pleasure of mine to have him here. And I can't wait to have him again. And I know Brian's going to listen to this and he's going to be like, Tro, why didn't you tell me to get on this? And so the next time he'll get on, um, this is Thomas Clifford. He's a, uh, been practicing martial arts for 40 years, uh, has had four or five schools in the Rockland, Bergen area, and has trained thousands and thousands of students over 40 years of martial arts experience, and a just incredibly nice guy, full of insight, full of experience. Uh, and pretty soon, you know, we've already started talking about how we're going to structure ways to work together to really fight uh, metabolic disease in this community around greater New York City. So thank you again. Thank you.